Twin City Federal presents Minnesota Milestones. The towering skyline. The story of forestry. This is a story of Minnesota. It's a story of man against the towering skyline, the battle against the woodland wilderness that once stretched endlessly. This is the story of a battle that was won, then lost, and then won again. WCCO presents the third in a series of 12 hour-long special broadcasts in honor of Minnesota's 1958 statehood centennial. This year-long series we call Minnesota Milestones. I'm E.W. Zebarth. I am Cedric Adams. And I am Bob DeHaven. Together, we will tell you the story of a band of hardy pioneers, of a wilderness that melted before the axe, the towering skyline turned to farmland. Sometimes it is not a pleasant story. There is plunder and there is greed. But there is, at least, understanding. And there is progress, too. Here in the march toward civilization are more Minnesota milestones. Minnesota, the towering skyline. No one knows where it began, the legend of Paul Bunyan. Paul just came. He came with the timber cruiser and bull of the woods and the feller and the sawyer. The lumberjack brought Paul Bunyan with him as he marched westward. His axe bit through the forests of Maine and New York and Michigan and through the Ohio Valley, and then through Wisconsin and to Minnesota. And Paul Bunyan was the mighty, the towering, the greatest logger of them all. That was Paul Bunyan. Paul Bunyan walked on a frosty morn Deep in the forest where the rivers have torn where his boat sank down, a mighty lake was born. Oh, a mighty man was he, a mighty man was he. Paul Bunyan tramped the woods around, one swing of his axe in a fury of sound. Six hundred pine trees came a crashing down. Oh, a mighty man was he, oh, a mighty man was he, oh, a mighty man was he. These early Minnesotans were not Paul Bunyans. They were not woodsmen, they were the settlers. And they came to farm to raise cattle and grow wheat. They cut down the big woods, the hardwood trees, and they rooted out the stumps and they stacked them and then burned them. Very little of the big woods country was logged off back there in the early 1800s, but men needed lumber. The soldiers at Fort Snelling needed timber for their barracks. And they constructed Minnesota's first sawmill way back there in 1821. It took hours for the water-powered saw to bite through the log, and so this is what happened. Well, we got the log all set, boys. Uh, while she's a-sawing, uh, let's go squirrel hunting. And along the St. Croix, where the rocks stand taller than even the towering skyline of the forests, that's where Minnesota lumbering got its start. It was in the 1830s that Minnesota's earliest pioneer lumberman, Joseph R. Brown, first cut logs. The place, well, you know it now as Taylor's Falls. Then there was the sawmill at Marine Mills, a mill that kept turning out millions of board feet for 50 years. And then came John McCusick from Stillwater, Maine. He and his men established mills, and they named the place Stillwater after their own hometown. And by the 1850s, the Valley of the St. Croix sang with the sound of the saw. Back in 1848, it was, a man named Franklin Steele built the first commercial sawmill at the Falls of St. Anthony. And the logs he sawed were cut up along the Crow River and floated to the Mississippi. 
Steel dealt with the Chippewa Indian chief, Hole in the Day. Yes, you heard that right. The chief's name was Hole in the Day. White brother needs many logs, O chief. Needs river filled with logs. Logs from here up there to the sky. Many logs, chief. Steel paid the chief 50 cents for each choice pine log. Steel's mill worked night and day to supply the demand for lumber for the incoming throngs of new settlers. Lumbering grew so fast that in 1855, a Stillwater editor wrote exuberantly in his paper, Do you still ask what is Stillwater? <laughs> it's the natural receptacle of the countless millions of logs that float down that river St. Croix. It takes trees to make lumber, of course, but in those days, rivers were just as important. And the logs came down the St. Croix and the Mississippi and the Rum and the Minnesota and the Crow Rivers. They came down the tributaries of the St. Croix. Goose Creek, Rush River, Rock Creek, Kettle and Sand Rivers, Hay, Bear and Crooked Creeks, all choked with logs from bank to bank every spring. Treaties with the Indians opened up the northern Minnesota lands to lumbering. And by 1860, the pioneer age of lumbering was over. Timber was business, big business. Millions of Minnesota board feet built the Middle West. Houses and store buildings in Chicago, St. Louis, Kansas City. Another Minnesota milestone. The day of a giant industry was just dawning. I guess we can safely say the door of opportunity back there in 1860 was often made of Minnesota pine. Nowadays, of course, the door itself may be different, but it still opens for the same combination, hard work, enterprise, thrift. It's the last that I'd like to talk to you just for a moment about now, specifically the thrift opportunities available to you at Twin City Federal. First of all, saving at Twin City Federal assures you of safety. Accounts are insured for safety by the Federal Savings and Loan Insurance Corporation, a permanent agency of the United States government. Secondly, you always earn a generous return at Twin City Federal. The current dividend rate is 3.5% compounded quarterly. And third, convenience. Parking is free, and parking is right at the door. Furthermore, if you live beyond driving distance, you can save by mail at Twin City Federal. For full details, just write to me personally, Cedric Adams here at WCCO. Just say that you'd like to learn about saving by mail, and I'll see that you get all the information you need from Twin City Federal. By mail or in person, why don't you make it a point now to get acquainted with Twin City Federal soon. Start enjoying greater progress. Progress through thrift, where the twin clock flashes the time and the temperature. It was in the summer when the trees rustled in the wind and the birds sang their summer songs. That was the time for the timber cruiser and his helper. The timber cruiser was an expert, a man with an eye on the towering skyline. He spent months camping out, looking, checking, figuring, and making notes. The cruiser found the best stands of timber. He picked the straightest trees. He found the nearest stream for floating the logs downriver to the mill. He reported to the owner who purchased the sections of land. And then, in late summer and early fall, came the construction crews. And there, in the wooded wilderness, they hammered together the lumber camp, the bunkhouse or shanty, the cook shack, and a lean-to for horses and oxen. And when the first snow of the season sifted down through the woods, late October or early November, in came the lumberjacks. Men of every nationality, there were French Canadians with broad backs and brawny arms. They could swing the axe tirelessly 12 to 14 hours all through the winter day. There were Indians and half-breeds and Poles and Swedes and German and Irish and Finns and English and Norwegians and Scotsmen. They all came to work in the woods in the great Minnesota pineries, and at night, when the work was done, the men sat on the long bench down in the bunkhouse shanty, a bench made of logs split in half and called the deacon seat. <laughs> 
And it was there that the legends of Paul Bunyan were born. Paul Bunyan assembled a hard-working crew, sourdough Sam, Johnny Inkslinger, too. The Bull of the Woods and Canada Jack, they pile cut logs in a mighty stack. With the rock as a plow, Paul cut a big slash. Through the frozen soil, he pulled it with a crash. Then all of the crew, they did jump for joy. Paul had made it the River St. Croix. Oh, a mighty man was he, a mighty man was he. Paul Bunyan was a sly one, a crafty as a fox. He hitched up, babe, his big blue ox. He hitched him to the ground and gave him the gold, and babe pulled the curse from Paul's logging road. Oh, a mighty man was he, a mighty man was he. At first, they were called shanty boys and pinery boys who simply lumbermen. It wasn't until the 70s that the term lumberjack came into use. But call him what you will, the lumberjack was a romantic figure in his day. He wore a mackinaw and a heavy fur cap. His trousers tucked into his high-laced boots with sharp steel caulks on the soles. He was broad of shoulder and strong of back. He was also hardworking, plodding, and most of the time, unwashed. His day began at 4 o'clock in the morning with a blast on the camp horn. Uh, roll out! Roll out! Daylight in the swamps, boys! Perhaps the most colorful of the morning calls was the one used in the camps on the St. Croix. Roll out! Tumble out! Any way to get out! This is the day you make your fortune! And then into breakfast in the cook shack. And what a breakfast! There were hash brown potatoes and salt pork, beans and flapjack with black strap molasses. Hot sourdough biscuits, dried apple pie, doughnuts, and tea. What about coffee? Well, that was not common in the lumber camps until the 1880s. And if you were a new man in the camp, you stood aside until the cook found you a place. If you were a new man and in a hurry to eat, you might sit down in another Jack's place. But just once. There would be a tap on the shoulder the first time it happened, and then... Bard, you're in the wrong stall. Move out! And if it happened the second time, then the scene would be like this. Oh, what'd you do? Kill me? Look, Pard, I told you once you was in the wrong stall. And I ain't gonna tell you again. Yes, a man was regarded a coward who allowed another to take his stall. And even visiting company officials waited until all the jacks were served before they sat down to breakfast. The jack was allowed time to smoke one pipe, and then he headed for the woods, the cold, wintry woods, for lumbering was a wintertime job. The men formed into cutting gangs, two sawyers and an undercutter or chopper who was foreman of the gang. All the trees were chopped in the early days until the improved crosscut saw came into use in the 70s. The undercutter chopped out part of the trunk to direct the tree's fall. And the sawyers went to work, cutting through the tree. And then with the giant of the forest swaying and tottering, came the familiar cry. And all day long, the woods echoed and re-echoed to sounds of chopping and sawing and the shouts and the crash of the forest giants. The noon meal was called flagons and brought out on the junk wagon. And on bitter winter days, the beans froze on the plates. But the jacks ate and went right back to work. There was no rest or relaxation. Along came the axe man to measure the fallen trees into lengths. The sawyers cut it, leaving the limbs on the top to rot in the forest. The logs were snaked to the skidway, and there the decker and the rigging gang put them in place beside the log road. At first, the logs were cut and stacked alongside the river to await the spring thaw. But it wasn't long before the river banks were stripped of timber, and the logs were hauled over makeshift winding roads. And since it was winter, Huge sleds were used to carry the logs to the rivers. The teamster frequently was one of the highest paid men in camp. He was up at four to feed curry and harness his horses. He drove thousands of logs with two, four, or six horses. And so hard were the horses worked that sometimes they would last only a single winter in the woods. <laughs> 
for teamsters, axemen, sawyers, trimmers, for all the jacks, the day's work ended only when it became too dark to see. Then it was back to camp for supper. The day was long, the work dangerous, and the pay was low. Choppers received 35 to $40 a month. Swampers and sawyers were working for $30. Ordinary hands from $20 to $25 per month back in 1870. At the top of the logging camp world were the cooks with $45 a month pay and the teamsters who received up to $70 per month. After supper at night, the jack went to the bunkhouse. There would be some talk and some yarn spinning, and at 9 o'clock sharp came that blast on the camp <laughs> horn. Jack's rolling! And that meant lights out and no talking until the horn sounded again next morning. After a week in the woods, it was no wonder the jacks broke loose on a Saturday night. All too often, the camp was too far away from town. There was no liquor allowed in camp and no women. But some of the jacks broke open their bottles anyway, and they danced. A stag dance it was. The women so-called were merely lumberjacks with handkerchiefs tied around their arms. The jacks did not feel like dancing every Saturday night. Sometimes they oiled their boots or played games. And a favorite was called Hot Bottom. A jack, usually a greenhorn, if there was one in the camp, would bend over. One of the others would hit him a mighty blow. He had to guess who had done it. If he guessed wrong, he had to bend over for another blow. The jacks who knew the game fortified themselves <laughs> on the board inside their pants. <laughs> and often, very often, the jacks merely sat around the bunkhouse and spun yarns. Paul Bunyan was a sly one, a crafty as a fox. He hitched up, babe, his big blue ox. He hitched him to a whole section of land. And babe pulled it all, every tree in the sand, down to the river bank to wait the spring thaw. The jacks cut the logs with a cross-cut saw and dumped them in the stream. No fuss, no work. That puzzled a greenhorn, his name was Kirk. What happened to the stumps, he wanted to know. The jacks bent double from laughing so. Cookie cut him up and put him in the stew. <laughs> and that, my buckle, is what stumped you. Oh, a mighty man was he. Oh, a mighty man was he. And slowly, spring came creeping through the woods. The water dripped from the snow-laden pines. It soaked the men as they worked. The woods were full of slush, but still they worked on. The Jack's winter weariness was over, for a new life was coming, the big spring drive. When the last log had been placed on the rollway, and when the snow had melted, when the ice had broken up, the lumberjack vanished until next season. He became a different man, the river pig ready to steer the vast log rafts downstream to the sawmills. The crew labored to clean the river of rocks. Brush along the banks was cut away. Windfalls were removed. Sometimes dams had to be built when streams were low. That stored the water so it could be released with a rush to carry the logs away. But when the spring freshet came, the rollway was broken and the logs roared and tumbled into the river. The river driver was soaked in skin most of the time. The wet clothes dried on his body, became wet and dried again. The driver had to be catty on the cocks, as the saying went. If he slipped, it meant death, and many men died in the churning white water. They had plenty of opportunity for it. The 320-mile drive from Grand Rapids to Minneapolis down the Mississippi took from 40 to 75 days. There was the boss driver, or the head push, as he was called. The extent of his authority depended on the force of his personality and his fists. There was Big Sam Hunter, the boss of the Mississippi, in his day the best man on the river. And Sam trained the green hands with no show of tenderness. Now you men are pigs, river pigs. And if you ain't, I'm gonna see that you become river pigs. Now jump in the river. Never mind the ice chunks in the river. When I say jump, I mean jump. Now you jump. That's it, everybody in. All right now, everybody out. 
All of you, come on up here. Now get to work. Get busy and warm up. And that was the way the head push handled his men in the old days. Three crews usually guided the logs along the way. The first crew was the driving crew. Its members urged the logs along, keeping them out of shoal water, steering them away from blind inlets. Next came the jam crew, and its business was to see that the channels were kept open. And then there was the rear crew. Theirs was a monotonous job, tracking down every stray log and keeping it out in midstream. But it was the jam crew that had the most dangerous work, exceedingly dangerous when jams did form. Huge mountains of logs would back up the water. And when the jam was broken, floods of destructive force were sometimes let loose. Back in 86, it was. That spring, there was one of the biggest jams in the history of Minnesota. It was on the St. Croix at Angle Rock, two miles above St. Croix Falls. More than 150 million feet of pine logs piled up there in a mass that ran back for miles. Thousands of persons came from St. Paul and Minneapolis to see it. Breaking that huge jam required a crew of 200 men, more than 100 horses, two donkey engines, and two steamboats. The job was to find the key log, and once the crew had located that, the whole jam gave way with a rush of water and a thunderous roar. The spring dry was the climax of the logging season, the end, until the snow began falling the next November. And the river pigs were free to have a high old time, which they did, right from the moment they hit town until they had spent the last of their pay. And any corn juice potent enough to make a man leap with the shock when it went down was referred to as squirrel whiskey. And that was the lumberjack, uncouth, unkempt, frequently illiterate, especially in the early days. In later years, though, farmers often worked as lumberjacks to eke out their income in the winter. And then when spring came and the drive was over, they returned home to plant their fields and bring in their harvest before returning to the woods the next fall. And for 70 years, the lumberjack was a very familiar figure in Minnesota with his mackinaw, his trousers tucked into his laced boots and his slouch hat. He carried out the orders from his superiors. It was the lumberjack who brought down Minnesota's towering skyline. Paul Bunyan's logging camp grew and grew to feed all the men in his tremendous crew. He built a griddle so long and so wide, you couldn't even see the other side. Flunky strapped bacon fat onto their feet and skated the grease around fast and neat. One hundred wagons, a hundred teams, and this is no lie, strange as it seems, carried the flapjacks up to the shack Cookies on roller skates darted back, filling all the platters hour after hour, while syrup came down from the water tower. Oh, a mighty man was he, a mighty man was he. And by the 1880s, Minnesota had a lumber industry, a giant industry it was. Minnesota was one of the biggest lumber producing states in the nation. There were 17 lumber mills in Minneapolis alone. Scores of mills were springing up all over Minnesota, along the rivers and along the railroads. Even in the small towns such as Hinkley, Pine City, and North Branch, there was at least one mill, sometimes several. Lumbering and the big mills spread northward and westward. Cloquet, Brainerd, Grand Rapids, Bemidji. T.B. Walker established a mill at Crookston, and for years, Crookston was known as the Sawdust City. Lumbering was so gigantic an enterprise that for a time back in the 90s, Stillwater showed promise of becoming Minnesota's biggest city. And where before lumbering had been done along the rivers and the streams, now came the railroads. The shining rails were laid through the forest, winding, twisting, curving, and bringing out the white pine logs by the train loads. And the towering skyline retreated ever northward, ever westward. Millions upon millions of feet of lumber, 100, 200, 300 million feet a year. More lumber than even a growing Minnesota could consume and huge rafts were floated down the Mississippi, down the father of waters to St. Louis. Bigger machinery, bigger saws, steam engines and steam hoists, and always more, more lumber from Minnesota. <laughs> 
Right now, how'd you like to step aboard Cedric's super time machine for a quick peek at the future? You just make yourself comfortable, and I'll press this button right here. We'll use a little imagination now and zip ahead a few years to uh, right about here. Say, that's a lovely house over there, isn't it? Is that the home you were dreaming about back there in 1958? And look, that young man. Evidently, he was just graduated from college. Could he be your boy? Lucky thing you started saving when you did for your home and for his education. Lucky, too, you saved where you did, where your money was safe where you earn such a generous return through the years. Right back here at Twin City Federal. Well, I hope you enjoyed the trip. And I hope sometime in the very near future that you start your savings account for that home, for that education fund, for whatever you want, where the twin clock flashes the time and the temperature. You're listening to Minnesota Milestones over WCCO, St. Paul, and Minneapolis. And as lumbering grew, so grew the power of certain men. This was the age of the lumber baron, a man of importance and influence in Minnesota's giant industry. Walker and Warehouser, Chevlin, Akeley, Bacchus, Carpenter, and Smith. There were sharp practices in the lumber industry from the very beginning, the history books tell us. William Watts Falwell reports the story in his book. He says that even back in territorial days, lumbering was often done by men who trespassed on public lands. And next came the dealing in government script. The script entitled the holder to certain lands and was non-transferable. Some lumber men would buy scrip from soldiers or Indians, locate on the land, cut down the trees, then use the same script to relocate elsewhere. After the Minnesota Homestead Act of 1862, more abuses developed. An agent for a lumber company might contact a group of settlers, perhaps in this fashion. Uh, now, I want each of you to file your claim and settle on sections uh, 25 and 26 in Pine County. Now, uh, you pay $1.25 an acre, you understand? Now, when you've received title to your land, why, uh, then you come to me and uh, I'll pay you $2.50 an acre. Thousands of square miles of pine lands were acquired in this way by the Lumber Kings. A lumber company would obtain title to a piece of land, log it, and also log off several thousand acres of adjoining land belonging to the state. The history books tell us that much of this robbing was done from state school lands, land areas set aside, the income from which was to aid the state's educational system. As a result of these and other practices, Senator Keller started an investigation into the failure of the state to tax pine lands and the stealing of pine timber from school lands. The Keller Committee found this practice. State timber scalers, or estimators, were hired for the purpose of giving independent service to all citizens. But the committee discovered some timber scalers were employed by the lumber companies and were then placed on the state payroll. The surveyors generally were found to have pocketed the scaler's fee. The committee found one scaler in the employ of the state reported 357,000 feet of timber cut from a section of land. Actually, the Itasca Lumber Company took 7 million feet. And here is testimony of State Auditor Beerman before the committee. Have you before you, uh, Mr. Beerman, the record of sale of Stumpage Book Number 2, uh, one of the records of your office? Yes, sir. Uh, do you find on uh, page 84 of that book a record of the sale of 364125? Now, was that the section sold as shown by that record to William Sauntry on September 3rd, 1890 at uh, $4.40 per thousand? Yes, sir. Was any cut ever reported to this office under the permit issued upon that sale? No, sir. And now, now did that uh, permit have the provision which states that if a party fails to cut the timber and the state was required to make another sale, that he should pay the state the difference in price? Yes, sir. And has any effort ever been made to collect from Mr. Sondry or his bondsman the difference between $4.40, the price bid by him at the first sale, and the $1.05 per thousand, the price of the second sale? No, sir. <laughs> 
As a result of the investigation, the Pine Lands investigation it was called, two lumber companies and one individual paid into the state treasury $30,000. Suits against some 20 corporations and individuals were expected to bring $400,000 to the state, but that was a mere nothing compared to the millions of dollars which was robbed from the state in that heyday of Minnesota lumbering. Paul Bunyan had a bad year. It was a year of pain. You hear about it now as a summer dry of rain. The rain came down as dust and made the jacks all sneeze and drill dry holes in the lakes just like a big Swiss cheese. Paul thought and thought and wondered what on earth to do. A grin soon spread across his face as a brand new idea grew. It was his own invention. He called it Instant Flood. He hauled it to the dried out land and spread it around like mud. He added a little water as you'd mix a batch of cakes and never in your life were there finer streams and lakes. Oh, a mighty man was he, a mighty man was he. It was a bad summer that year, back in 1894. From May to September, the sun burned in nearly cloudless skies. All summer, only a little more than two inches of rain fell. The woods were dry and crackling brown. Logging and farm clearing had been going on for 25 years around Hinckley in Pine County. On the cutover lands were piles of slashings, branches cut from the towering pines and stumps rooted from the earth. And growing in this tangled mass of refuse, there was underbrush, second growth pine, spruce, poplar, and birch. For months, the forest had been smoldering, the air filled with smoke. The correspondent for a St. Paul newspaper reported in July, The fires around here are spreading rapidly, and everything is as dry as tinder. And unless a heavy rain comes soon, there may be a great loss sustained. An engineer of the St. Paul and Duluth Railroad, James Root, remarked sadly, We've had to run through smoke time and again this year. They've always been Forest fires were part of the scenery. No one paid them much heed unless they roared right up to the outskirts of city or town. So back on that fateful morning of September 1st, 1894, the air was filled with smoke, but there was no alarm. Blazing stumps of pine lighted up a logging road in the long swamp west of Hinckley. But the citizens were a little uneasy. The smoke seemed to be a little worse. Yes, it was blue-gray for a few moments, and then a tawny yellow. Everybody in town was talking about it. It looked ghastly, ghostly, unreal. When the office clock pointed to noon, bookkeeper George Albrecht had a light burning so he could see to write. Falling ash dried his ink, and then, uh, from that swamp north of town, a puff of flame and a shower of sparks from that burning swamp west of town. The sparks fell on the piles of lumber in the mill yards, Joe Barden and a crew went to work. Young Alan White, shingle weaver at the mill, talked it over with a friend. The men say the, the whole swamp west of town is ablaze now. Yes, Father Fowler and I were talking about it this morning in front of the bank. He didn't say all that was on his mind, but oh, I have a notion he was kind of uneasy. I, t- I tell you, I don't like it. it, it it's never, it's, well, it's never been quite like this before. The one o'clock whistle blew, and the mill hands all went back to work. And then the wind began to blow. The volunteer fire department under Chief John T. Craig was called to the edge of town, where a dozen small fires were already burning. But they found that neither water nor dirt had any effect. The wind increased, and when it came hot coals that burned and smoldered in streets, there were more sawdust than soil. It was still early afternoon, but a cloud, big and black, dark as night, appeared over the treetops. At the St. Paul and Duluth Railroad Depot, telegraph operator Tommy Dunn received the last message he would ever handle. Pokegama, nine miles south, was being destroyed by fire at that very moment. Its inhabitants were burning to death. 
great black cloud bore down on Hinckley, Douglas Greeley, the proprietor of the hotel, stood just a moment on the porch to watch it. He listened to the far-off roar that sounded like a great waterfall. And just then, Father Lawler, the priest, came running down the street. He'd been working with the fire department. He had seen the worst. Run! Run! Run for your lives! It's a forest fire! Run to the gravel pit! Run to the river! Save yourselves! Run! Forest fire! Run to the gravel pit! Everybody! Run to the gravel pit! It's a forest fire! To the gravel pit! To the gravel pit! And then it struck, a fury of furies. The hot breath of fire surged into town. There was no time to save anything. Mothers snatched their babies from flour barrel cradles and ran, ran pell-mell. Some toward the railroad depot, and there engineer William Best stood at the throttle of his locomotive, a few coaches and boxcars hitched behind. The bells jangled to hurry the fleeing townspeople. They clambered quickly aboard the hot breath of fire licking at the depot, the paint blistering on the coaches. Engineer Best saw that he could wait no longer. He let go a blast on the whistle, and with bells ringing and the throttle wide open, the train moved away from the now blazing station. And a new and greater hurricane of wind swept into town. The roar increased. Engineer Best looked back and watched Hinkley burn. It was a moment he never forgot. He saw men and women, horses and cows, stagger into the street, go down to stay. The fire leaped at sides of houses, stripped them clean, exposed for an instant the rooms and the furniture inside. And as he said later, the houses somehow seemed to melt. But the train kept going, running in the pitched blackness of the smoke, kept going to superior and to safety. But in Hinckley, fire, relentless fire, hunted down most of the remaining citizens. 127 of them took refuge in a swamp along the eastern Minnesota railroad tracks. They were burned to black crisps. Alan Fraser, one of the survivors, was near enough to hear them die. He heard... <coughs> and then only this. Some 200 citizens ran north along the St. Paul and Duluth tracks. Tongues of flame reached out from the forest and licked at them. They dropped one by one, their bodies lying there between the rails. There was only one safe spot in Hinckley that day, the gravel pit. Citizens had complained bitterly against the railroad for leaving it there, the yawning open eyesore with two acres of shallow water. But more than 100 of them now found it a place of refuge, sank to nose level in its welcome coolness. Horses, dogs, cats, animals of the forest came unerringly to the one spot where they could live. A few more survived, part of the 200 who fled along the railroad tracks. Through the murk and the gloom, they saw a headlight coming at them. The train was number four, the Duluth Limited, southbound to St. Paul. Engineer Jim Root stopped his train, got down out of the cab. He knew he could go no further south. He helped the suffering, singed wayfarers aboard, climbed into his cab, reversed the lever, and then opened throttle. A few miles back, Jim Root knew there was a swamp hole called Skunk Lake. The heat was intense. Paint was running down the walls of the coaches inside the train. Root fainted at the throttle. His fireman revived him, his hands blistered. The solder ran down the boiler. Even the coal in the tender smoldered as though in a grate when number four rolled across the Skunk Lake Bridge. Fireman McGowan threw water on the blazing train steps and the passengers, men, women, and children, tumbled into the water mud of the lake some 18 inches deep. They sat with slime to their armpits, covered their heads with wet clothing as fire surged overhead. But out of those fires, out of the blackened land, man learned. From the terrible lesson of death and sorrow, there arose new understanding, new hope. And in the days ahead, out of that charred earth would grow the foundations of the modern forest industry, a restoration of the towering skyline. Let's uh, chat for just a moment about home financing. Did you know that Twin City Federal was the Northwest's leading home financing institution? 
That's right. And the important thing is, Twin City Federal grew to such size, helping people in all income groups to buy their own homes. More important still, Twin City Federal would be very happy to help you plan to buy or build a home in the Twin Cities area. All modern types of mortgage plans are available. Conventional mortgages include the valuable open-end feature, which uh, lets you add on to your loan if you wish to remodel or repair sometime in the future. So if you have a home in mind, why not jot one of these addresses down? 8th and Marquette, Minneapolis, 6th and Robert, St. Paul. Stop in and discuss your plans at Twin City Federal, where the twin clock flashes the time and the temperature. Don't hesitate to drive down now. The parking is free and the parking is so convenient, you park right at the door at Twin City Federal. We continue now with the saga of Minnesota's forests. Paul Bunyan found the virgin pine had all been logged away. So he invented a new pine that grew 12 feet per day. The pine shot skyward with such speed. The jacks had to jump when they dropped the seed. Oh, a mighty man was he, a mighty man was he. But still there spread across Paul's face a scowl and then a frown. The trees grew so dead blame fast the jacks couldn't cut them down. So Paul invented an elevator to stand beside its pine. The jacks went skyward with the tree and cut it down just fine. Oh, a mighty man was he. A mighty man was he. And one by one, the mills shut down across Minnesota. The Weyerhaeuser Mill in Minneapolis ground to a halt in 1919. All but one of the Duluth mills were gone by 1920. The largest white pine mill in the world, the one at Virginia, closed on October 9th, 1929. On that day, as the last log was sent through the screaming saw, there was sounded a long blast on the plant whistle. And it was the requiem for an industry, once the lifeblood of Minnesota, but now sinking, fading, and dying. But from the silent factories and from the laboratories, there did come new hope. Back in 1918, after the Cloquet Fire it was, two lumber company presidents, Rudolph Weyerhaeuser and Harry Hornby, talked it over and determined to keep the mills going. Harry, there's not the slightest doubt in my mind. The day of saw timber is gone. It's finished. We've got to think in terms of something new, new wood products. Well, I agree, all right. But the question that bothers me is what products? What can you do with wood besides saw it into lumber? Those two men didn't know the answer, not just then. But they hired chemists who went to work and did come up with some answers, and their achievements restored the lumber industry. They created a new term, a life-giving term, forest products. And in the 20s and 30s, the mills, new and more modern mills, began grinding again. The machinery hummed, turning out cellulose for paper, insulation, wallboard, sheathing. And the mills used what were known as the weed trees, basswood and tamarack, the no-good trees. They were made into forest products, into building materials for a new, modern type of construction. And other new words came into being as a result of the forest-destroying fires and the depletion of Minnesota's once rich timber reserves. Conservation, forest ranger service, fire towers. The term cut over land was dropped from the language and the new expression arose, tree farms, planned cultivation of timber crops. All this came as men began at last to listen to a voice which had been preaching for years Christopher Columbus Andrews, the most important single figure in the conservation of Minnesota's forest resources. Way back in the 1800s, Andrews had begun his campaign. 
forests must be perennial. You cannot take more from a forest than you plant, or more than will grow in any given year. Grow forests on poor soil, on poor land, on the land that cannot be farmed. Your forests are essential to the health and recreation of the people. Forests clothe the wastelands and check damaging runoff. And the words that Andrews uttered 50, 60 years ago are now the established policy of the Department of Conservation, the Keep Minnesota Green Committee of federal, state, and local government. And industry heeds those words today. The lumber industry is pledged to guard against fire, disease, and public entry. Industry and forest owners promise to thin the trees to improve growth and quality. They promise to plant, to reforest, and they harvest in cycles, always saving, conserving, hoarding this precious resource. And now in 1958, the value of Minnesota's forest products is $200 million a year. And that's a dollar volume greater than even the billions of board feet of saw timber turned out in Minnesota's lumber heyday. The towering skyline is being rebuilt faster than it is now being depleted. And now in the summers, Minnesotans and tourists by the thousands enjoy the great state parks and the stately national forests which spread the entire breadth of northern Minnesota. 428,000 acres of forest land are set aside in Minnesota for parks and recreational reserves and the importance of preserving Minnesota's forest resource is today a never-ending task. Well, look who's coming up the trail now. Big as life with his ranger's hat and shovel and all togged out in dungarees. He's the friend of all who love the outdoors. He's the popular candidate, the people's choice for support this year and every year. He's Smokey Bear with a special message for us. Hello there, folks. I'm sure counting on your support in my campaign against carelessness with fire, especially the fire in lighted cigarettes, cigars, and in pipes. There's a responsibility that goes with smoking, whether you smoke indoors or outdoors. That responsibility is to make sure every time that your smoke is out, dead out, when you're through with it. Well, I'll be seeing you. Foresters see another big problem the conflict among groups who want to use our towering skyline for different purposes, individual outdoorsmen, commercial fishermen and trappers, and those who seek water power, lumber and pulp, and commercial vacation centers. From these come increasing pressures on our natural forest resources. One phase of this problem may be resolved by new developments in science. Forest genetics has now produced a timber that grows twice as fast as it did 50 years ago. The goal of science is to produce still larger trees, even faster. And there is hope of developing fast-growing trees of the same quality as Minnesota's original virgin stands of white pine. With the increasing demands for pulpwood, for sawed lumber, for the products of forest industries, Minnesota's forests will continue to be one of our most important resources for the next 100 years. And the summer breeze still sings its song through the forest trees, the towering stately pines, and the woodsman's powered saw, an educated woodsman with a carefully handled saw, is still heard there in the woodlands. And Minnesota's forests, and its timber, and its pulpwood, and its industry will be there for another 100 years, and all because man has learned to save, to conserve, the Minnesota towering skyline. <laughs>